Paul, you know, it's a different context. He didn't really mean that. Or they'll say, you know, Paul was actually letting some of his uh, his cultural upbringing actually taint his teaching there. And plus, Paul's writings are good, but they're not the red letters. Right. So I can yeah. do whatever I want. Yeah. Uh, and they come up with ways to reject what, what God says in other places and say, since it's not essential for salvation, you're free to do what you want. To me, that seems dangerous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Welcome to the Real Life Overtime Podcast, the place where the members of the Real Life Ministries sermon team go deeper into the weekend sermon. Watch them as they unpack, unfold, and unravel the weekend sermon like never before. So fasten your seatbelts, hit play, and join us for Real Life Overtime, where every episode is an adventure and this sermon doesn't end on Sunday. Hello, Real Life Ministries. Welcome to our Overtime Podcast. Uh, today, we are discussing part two of our series on Stand Firm. And uh, this last week, uh, at all the campuses, it was all a uh, video from the Post Falls campus. Uh, but uh, just as we always do, we bring in representatives of the different campuses to discuss. And, and not only did those guys help create that sermon last week, but now they, uh, they have some things to say today, and I get to introduce them, and we'll talk about uh, the result of yesterday and what people were getting, the questions they were having. And, and so I'm, I'm here today with Blake Whiteman, who is the campus lead for our Coeur d'Alene campus. Good to have you, buddy. Good to be here. Thank you. Uh, I also am with Titus Ledger, who is uh, runs adult ministries, a lot of other things up there in uh, the north. Thanks. And so, thanks for being here, Titus. It's good. You know, uh, in the in this series, uh, Sam kicked it off a few weeks ago, talking about um, you know Paul's letter to the the Thessalonians, first and second letters, and and uh, gave a history of how the church got started by Paul. Uh, Paul had come from Philippi. Uh, being run out of in one area, coming to it another. He shares Christ, they accept Christ, he moves on uh, to another place, he writes a letter back, and and just really saying, listen, stand firm. Yeah. And, uh, and so this week, uh, I kind of took the subject and said, all right, stand firm on what? And so I walked through uh, the writings of Paul about himself, about his authority, about where he got it, the Lord Jesus, and and over and over again, um, Paul makes the point that you need to stand firm in the message that we have given you, that, that he had given. And um, we walk through how the Bible was very clear that someday people are going to kind of sneak in and distort the truth, mm -hmm. uh, change the gospel, add things, take things away, and, and uh, that... All Scripture is God's read, the disciples said, which includes mm -hmm. the Old Testament, but it also includes the New Testament writers. Right. And, uh, and so they back each other up, and they support one another, and, and it's the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, meaning what has been given isn't going to change. The Holy Spirit affirmed it, um, and Jesus had pointed that out that that was going to be coming, that they would be a part of that as messengers. And so for 2,000 years, we've been looking at the gospel, the uh, scriptures. And again, when I, when I you know, uh, 1 Timothy uh, tells us that, that uh, the scriptures were able to make us wise to mm -hmm. salvation, the gospel, but also all scripture is God-breathed. The rest of scripture is... Um, uh, inspired, affirmed, that it, it gives us our standard of right living. Mm -hmm. So you've got the message of the gospel is you can be declared righteous because of Jesus' payment on the cross. You are sanctified, becoming holy based on the scriptures that God give us about righteousness. And we, we live in a culture where people want to believe, or they say they want to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and he rose from the dead, but they want to reject what Jesus said uh, as written down by the apostles mm -hmm. and as given to us in the rest of the New Testament. So I'm saved, but I don't actually have to do what, what uh, the Lord tells us to do mm -hmm. when it comes to marriage or working hard or sexuality or uh, 
you know, whatever. We can do whatever we want there because of Jesus dying on the cross right. and raising from the dead. As you guys were talking with people yesterday, was there uh, any sort of hubbub? I got some, you know, I'll bring yeah. up here, but I'm sure um, so many people, they want to say they're Christians, but don't even know what God's Word says about mm -hmm. itself, about mm -hmm. what it means to walk with Jesus. Uh, they don't want to be discipled. They want to visit church every once in a while. They want to think they're Christians. And my mm. one of my fears is that they're going to be surprised. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus said on that day of judgment that there are some people are going to be surprised by the outcome. He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Yeah. You honored me with your lips, but your hearts were far from me. Mm -hmm. And I don't want people to be surprised. And so I think there are going to be people who are surprised mm -hmm. because they accepted a version of Christianity, which really isn't Christianity. Did you hear anything over there? Yeah. You know, one of the things that stood out, I listened on Thursday night, and you were saying uh, there are people who want to take everything after the Gospels and simply say, okay, we'll believe the letters that are written in red, Jesus' words, but nothing else. And they, they fail to make the connection that those books are written down by the apostles, mm -hmm. you know, or like Mark uh, writing on behalf of Peter or Luke as he was in connection with Paul and, and the other apostles. And so the idea that you could just simply take the Gospels, Jesus' written word, and then exclude the rest, not only do you have an anemic Christianity after that, but you're really, it's not logical, right? That this is really one package deal altogether. And then for us now, as we're interpreting the scripture, to be able to say, okay, in the last 50 years, we figured out something that in the last 2,000, they never knew. Mm -hmm. That's also illogical, that we can apply God's word better than they could apply God's word, which is why we've come to our ideas on you know, women preaching, which is one of the ones that you had brought up on Thursday night. And so both of those were just kind of like, I've heard them before, but it just like sparked anew in my brain, like, yeah, that's why we look to the early church. That's why we look to the first followers to be like, okay, how did they understand these? How did they live it out? Uh, so that we aren't just swayed by our cultural tendencies right now, which are hard. It's like trying to look at your circumstances around you. It's hard to actually tell where you are because I grew up in this. And so it's yeah. so yeah. normal. Yeah, that's, that's good. Everybody understands in the Christian world that there are rules for interpreting Scripture. Uh, that's called hermeneutics. Yeah. And there are rules like this, make total sense. Um, understanding the language it was written in and what that those words meant at the time it was written, because mm -hmm. words uh, change their meanings over time. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to understand what was written by those guys, you have to understand how that Greek word or that Hebrew word or their Aramaic word was used at the time it was written. If all scripture is God breathed, our job is to go, what did God mean by that? Mm -hmm. And how do I understand it? So there's there's rules like the grammatical principle. There's mm -hmm. rules like um, context, uh, historical principle. What was happening at the time? What's the context in yeah. which it was written? And And if you can understand that, then you get a better understanding of the historical meaning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, 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 the synthesis principle, when you're talking about different scriptures, um, for instance, the synthesis principle was used by Jesus when he's in the desert, and here comes the devil, and he says, hey, turn these stones into bread, and Jesus says, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then the devil goes, oh, okay, we're going to quote scripture. Yeah. Right? So he pulls a scripture out of the book of Psalms, and says, hey, he took him to the to the top of the temple wall there, and he says, throw yourself down, and he quotes scripture. It is written. Yeah. Right? But Jesus said something important. He says, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So what did he do? He said, you're, you're cherry-picking a verse, mm -hmm. devil. You're misusing it. I, Jesus, using the synthesis principle, says, I'm going to take all that God has said on a subject and right. bring it together and go, yes, God could, if he commanded me to yeah. throw myself down from the temple, then the angels would keep me from striking my heel. Mm. But God didn't tell me to do that. Yeah. So I'm not just going to do something. Uh, and so he, he puts the scriptures together. Putting scripture together, because if all scripture is God-breathed, mm -hmm. there, there's going to be some 
internal connection. There's not a, a contradiction. God's not going to mm-hmm. teach two absolutely opposite things uh, at the same time. It's a law of non-contradiction. So how do you put it all together to understand what God wants you to do in a certain circumstance? Yeah. One of the things I talked about this going on right now in particular is, I use the example of Matthew Vines, mm-hmm. who wrote a book, and he became pretty famous. He's you know, been on all kinds of different shows because he's Christian. He's a he's a homosexual, practicing homosexual <clears throat> uh, pastor who is teaching that homosexuality is not sin. And so he goes through all of the Old Testament and he dismisses that for one way or another. And and one of the key passages is in First Corinthians six, where Paul says, "No homosexual offender." is going to inherit the kingdom of heaven, amongst other things, which is important. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that homosexuality is worse than greed, or, or uh, it, it, we're saying, no, homosexuality is sin, and why, mm. why are we dealing with that one? Well, because that's the one they're actually promoting and saying it's not sin. Mm-hmm. You know, if you were saying, hey, lying isn't sin, so you should do it, it's totally okay to do it, now I'd go, wait a minute, but they're mm. not saying lying's okay, they're saying homosexuality is sin. Okay, so no, we gotta we gotta answer that. We're not saying when we attack that, no, we're not saying it's worse or it can't be forgiven. It can be. It's just as bad as you're saying is doesn't even need to be forgiven, and it's not wrong. So go ahead and do it. So we have to address that. Yeah. And so mm-hmm. Matthew Vine says what was really going on that Paul was really dealing with was um, that adults were sexually abusing children. So when he says homosexual offender, he means these adults are, are, are buying children, forcing children into sex at very young ages. So he's addressing that. Mm-hmm. So when he says homosexual offender, it's not being homosexual. It's being a homosexual who offends, abuses, uses their power to uh, abuse children. Mm-hmm. And so he's, he makes up a context. This is what was going on in Rome at that time. And so this is what Paul was dealing with. And, okay, I'm not going to deny that there have been people sexually abusing children for as long as sin's been around. Mm -hmm. It's never okay. Right. Right? But what he did is he changed the historic meaning of that text. He came up with a context to make it so that homosexuality wasn't wrong, homosexuality offending is wrong in the sense of children. Mm -hmm. The historic perspective for 2,000 years Mm -hmm. has been... If you're a home, you have same-sex attraction, and you say no to them, just like somebody with heterosex attraction, you you deny it, you reject it, you're going to be obedient to the Lord whether you want to do it or not. That's not sin. The the text or the context of what Paul was saying, according to history, 2,000-year-old history was, if you have those attractions and you give in to them and practice them, you're a homosexual offender. So what he did is he created a new historical context for a very old passage and twisted in such a way that Mm -hmm. he's redefined whether homosexual activity, practicing homosexuality, he's redefining that as being okay as long Mm -hmm. as it's between consenting adults. Mm -hmm. So you've got an old scripture with 2,000 years of meaning to it, and now in 2000 uh, we can come up with some new meaning that it never meant before, and that's okay. Hmm. And so we're talking about same with women. Yeah. Women right now, he, Paul's not saying women do not teach or take authority over a man, you know, in, in the context of church service. Mm. He's what they're really saying. We've got other historians that are going, what they're really saying is we had some problem women in Ephesus, and they were just shouting in the middle of the service. And so Paul is saying, I do not allow a woman to teach or take authority over men. He meant not all women. He meant that women, those women. And, uh, and, of course, that's never been the view of that passage. They would pass the Scriptures around. The early mm-hmm. church didn't have elders or pastors who were women. Did they have elders and uh, have women who taught? Yes, older women teach the younger women. Mm-hmm. Uh, that they, they influenced it. Could a woman have a conversation with a man about theology when they're walking down the street? Yes, Priscilla and Aquila had mm-hmm. a conversation with, with Apollos, and uh, they taught him the way of the Lord more adequately, and I'm sure she participated in that conversation, but it wasn't in a the context of a leadership gathering together, body of believers together, the, the role of elder, 
pastor teacher has been referred or, or, or reserved for men in both the Old and the New Testament. Yeah. And so by creating a different context, we can say, well, no, that's not really what, what's being said. So what we're, we're trying to teach our people here at Real Life Ministries is um, that there is a faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. There was an understanding of that faith. Uh, from a historical perspective, who would understand best what was meant hmm. by a specific passage and best applied in practice? Those closest to the event. In the early church, they spoke the, the same language. They could ask Paul or Peter or whoever, mm -hmm. uh, even Jesus by the disciples could say, what did you, what did you mean by that? Yeah. How would you ask, ask us to apply that? And then their practice, as you see in the book of Acts, you know, and in the New Testament, you see how they practiced it in the first church, being that they, they, were, they could know the people that they heard it from, ask questions and apply it. And so when you look at history... When you don't have any uh, women pastors or elders in the first church, or all the way up until the Marcionites, were, were, was, it was a cult group that sprung up, and the early church fathers were writing that this is not a valid form of Christianity mm -hmm. because they have women prophetesses preaching and teaching and leading. And, you know, and, and, and so the only time you actually see it in the first three, four centuries, in fact, for almost 1,700 years— is in uh, where the Marcionites are actually being um, mm. rebuked by the rest of the church because they're allowing something that was not allowed mm. uh, in the early church. Now, again, um, I think people have abused the authority that men have given so that it's controlling and it, it's a privilege and you have to do it. No, that's not the kind of leadership we're talking about. You're right. We should be talking about God's kind of leaders— but we don't swing the pendulum over and go, God didn't make leaders. No, he made leaders, set them in charge of churches and houses. What kind of leaders is off course? So let's talk about that. But yeah. let's don't th throw the baby out with the bathwater. Hmm. Yeah, it's good. Um, you know, we had got some feedback even from our congregation this week uh, in light of the message that you gave was, was really good and caused a lot of people to put themselves into this reality to ask the question, okay, if there's a faith that has been once and for all delivered, that is not a snapshot of certain letters or the Gospels only, but is the entirety of Scripture, which we talk about and believe that's mm -hmm. true. How do I know what that faith is? Mm -hmm. How do I know what the faith is? Mm -hmm. Right? Any feedback of like, well, man, there's popular opinion, or there's lots of pastors, or there's there's podcasts, and there's things. And so if it must be shared, and, it, and there's groups of people that are following that, then it must be right. And so, which kind of brings up our conversation for today, of what we aspire to as a group, as a church, is to actually be committed to being taught and learned and discipled as to what that faith is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the greater arching story, which the, the current situation that we find ourselves in now is not new, right? Nothing, nothing's new under the sun. We know that. Through the history of creation, there's always been a people group that have been associated with God that are on course and then off course, mm -hmm, that are yeah. obedient and faithful and then not. Mm -hmm. And all throughout history, God's people have always been claimed by God as his people, mm -hmm. those that are trusting him. But there's always been seasons of rebellion and disobedience mm -hmm. and off course. And if you take a snapshot in that moment of time, whether it's through the era of judges, right, or the, or the redemption cycles that you see, you would go, well, right there, they're doing it wrong and that's incorrect. Well, absolutely. But yet again, here's God's story of redemption and redeeming, mm -hmm. which is brought by consequences and a remnant that has to get back on course. And so God's yeah. been telling this story forever, which kind of leads us to today to go, how are we being faithful as the called out ones today, to fight to learn what that truth is. Yeah. Taking it from context in all of these different versions and applying it to our context now, what's true and what's not? And so, you know, the, the, the easy answer to that is, man, this is why we do what we do as a church, is to be committed to being in relationship with other people, actually being willing, I'm speaking to myself here, yeah. to submit to authority for people that have gone before, that have put the work in, that have been taught, that have been discipled, that to, to stand on their shoulders to go, I need to be taught. I need to learn. I need to learn to ask the right questions. I need to check what is true and what's not true. And that's a journey. 
And that's why discipleship and relationship, right, is something that we choose to do so that we can go, man, that sounds, that sounds right, or I haven't heard that, or who do I talk to? Mm -hmm. Who can I ask those questions to? Who can, who can I bounce this off of rather than, well, I guess it, that sounds good, so I guess it must be true. Right, yeah. So, yeah, that's to study the Word, to, to allow yourself to be discipled, to, you're, you're right, to study requires some work, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I challenge pastors with all the time, I get you're being taught by modern scholars and the internet and, and professors today, mm -hmm. and you don't go in and go, just because you have authority in a school or in mm -hmm. a church or whatever, do it doesn't mean that you are committed to the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, asking where did that version of Christianity start, or where did that idea start? Uh, for m my journey was okay. I'm going to become a Christian, but which Christianity? I mean, mm -hmm. Jesus really was the Son of God, so uh, it really happened. And you know, I studied the witnesses and all that. Well, okay, now I need to become a Christian, but which one? Which version? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, they and being a history guy, I could go. Okay, the Catholic Church officially became the Catholic Church uh, after Constantine in the three hundreds. Um, they started with even views at that point, and then as time goes by, they came to believe that when the Christians get together, they could actually come up with a shared meaning that was different mm -hmm. than what uh, the first church actually had. They mm -hmm. actually came up with a way, almost like a progressive revelation. If we all get together and we read a passage and we decide on something, we can say that's what God always meant. Mm -hmm. uh, or mm -hmm. this is a new meaning. I mean, even right now, the, the Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra, you know, sort of a thing, he gets to be the voice of God on planet Earth. Right. Regardless oh. of what was said before, um, he has the authority of God, which then, if it changes, then then there's how how does God change His mind or, you know, it, why did it? You guys say that, uh, for instance, uh, as time went on, Mary became uh, the co-redemptress, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. never sinned, uh, all of that. Was that the the view of the first church? No. Well, why do you have the right to change it? you set up a mechanism by which you can change things. Mm -hmm. um, if you follow history, the church split uh, the Great Schism in 1056. You've got the Orthodox and the uh, Catholic Church splitting. You've got... Uh, and then, then the Catholic Church further splits in the Reformation movement. And you've got different guys coming at different co times, coming with a, some sort of new idea, usually claiming that it was a part of the first church's idea. Mm. But then you have to go... Was it? Let's go back and look at where they get that from. When did they start making this statement, for instance, that infants should be baptized? Where did that happen? Mm -hmm. Was that what they did in the first church? Do we have any evidence of that? And so in history, you can go back and read what's called the Apostolic Fathers. You can read the, the, uh, uh, the, the guys who are the disciples of the disciples. You get no hint of any of that until they make a decision in the, in the second century, and then finally in the third century. Well, again, as a historian, you want to go back and get as close to the beginning as you can to faithfully understand what God's Word says, not necessarily incorporate some new view. Right. Mm -hmm. But most people don't know what's new and what isn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So I, I, you, we were talking about uh, our conversation, I, I, Sean McDowell. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you tell that story? Yeah, well... He was talking with someone. I think they were introducing the idea that you know women can be pastors. No, it was homosexuality. It was homosexual. Okay, uh, you can be a Christian and be a practicing Praxis. homosexual. Okay, and and his response was, "Can you think of any theologian that's not in the last fifty years that would agree with you and say the same idea?" And it was kind of just one of those conversation stoppers because I don't think the man had a reply for him. No. And I think that's actually a good question, not just for that conversation, but for any conversation, even if it's just me. Right. Can I think of some, can I think of a theologians for the last, you know, 2000 years, not within the last 50, that would say the same thing that we're saying right now? Because like you were saying, we're coming up with new meanings and almost like, I, I think it's called the trajectory hermeneutic, this idea that, you know, Jesus kind of yep. got us started, but now we're actually supposed to figure out where he was hoping right. to go. 
man, you could hope that he could go way over here to all the way over there. And that's just not the way the Bible was written. Mm-mm. Not not if you read it. Yeah. It says, this is once for all. Here it is. This is what you need to know to live life. If anybody adds to this. Right. Don't do it. You know, your plagues will be added. Right. Right. Uh, anybody takes away from this, your place will be taken out. You know, yeah. end of Revelation. Uh, those are, that's yeah. right. And Paul said, like, if, if I came or if an angel comes and preaches a different gospel than the one I've already presented to you, let them be accursed. And so there's this idea that we're really standing firm. And we were just chatting before the podcast that there's a motivation because we're commanded to. And so we want to please God. Mm-hmm. But there's also a motivation for me to stand firm for my kids' sake. Right. And not just my kids, but all the kids right now to be like, I want them to have a model to follow because they need to learn resilience now. Like, I don't want to make my kids' life always easy. Because if I make it easy now, they're not going to have that strength built up when they're you know, teenagers to be like, you know, I hear that, but I'm actually going to go check on that. I'm actually going to learn some church history Mm -hmm. and to know, you know, hey, that was actually Benjamin Franklin you're quoting. That doesn't even come from scripture, (laughs) which happens all the time when someone's like, well, the Bible says this. And I'm like, I've read the whole thing cover to cover. It's not in there. You should go check your source. And I want my kids to be able to do the same thing so that they're not easily fooled. Yeah, That sure. led to something I, t- I didn't talk about in the last <laughs> service, but I think most everybody else got it. There's this new statement out there that people are following, mm. and it was actually given by a Lutheran pastor in the 1800s, but he said this, because there's this difference of opinion, and, and we want unity. The church needs unity, but unity around what? <laughs> Ephesians says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, right? Oneness. I appeal to you by the authority of the Lord Jesus, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.10, that you be of one mind and one heart, you know, that he wants us to be unified. John 17, Jesus said, you'll know that they're Christians by your love for one another. May they be brought to complete unity, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and sanctify them by the word, your word is truth. So sanctify them by the word, your word is truth. The word is central around that, but human beings have a hard time doing that. So he made a statement, I think it was probably well-intentioned, but he said this, uh, this uh, Lutheran pastor. He said, um, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things love. All right, so that could be a good thing, that could be a, 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 a dangerous thing. Here's why. When you say in essentials unity, somebody has to decide what the essentials are. Okay, so what are those? Mm. Every, the problem is people have always had differing ideas mm-hmm. about what that is. Mm-hmm. So how do we, if we don't go back to the beginning, look at some of the creeds, look at what they believed in the beginning, if you don't start there, then somebody can come up with e- essentials that they think of today versus what they were thinking of at the time. The faith was once for all delivered. So in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. Now here's my problem with the statement. Um, if it's non-essential, do you mean that you have freedom to do what you want? So again, if you don't, what, what's essential? If it's a non-essential, what I mean, what I think you mean by that is uh, non-essential means it's not a salvific issue. It's not sure. for salvation. So what's included in that? Now, I, I use the example of where Paul is talking to uh, in... in uh, his Thessalonian letters, about people who are not working. Hmm. And he says, warn them. He says, I, you know, in, in other places he says, if they won't work, they won't eat. Warn them uh, and uh, to, to not be idle, to live a life worthy. And then he says, if they, if they won't acknowledge these teachings, have nothing to do with them. Hmm. Right? Um. Now, if you were them at that time, they could say, well, it's not a salvation issue. I mean, am I, am, are you saying I'm going to hell if, if I don't go work? Mm-hmm. Now, well, wait a minute. There's a command to go work or you're ignored. You know, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're not to be a part of the group. You're to have nothing to do with them. So you don't get to be a part of the group. I'm not, I don't get to say whether you're going to hell or not. Uh, I do know that I was told to teach everything that Jesus commanded. He gave the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's role is to teach the apostles, give them the commands that they give to us. Paul says over and over again, by the authority of the Lord Jesus, I give you this. Mm. 
anybody who doesn't listen to these things should be in it. Okay, so if it's not a salvation issue, then am I free to do whatever I want? I don't have to listen because I'm saved. Same with like uh, in Ephesians. Uh, you've got wives that are told to submit to their husbands as, as to the Lord. And you've got men who are told to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. So let's say that I decide I'm not going to love my wife the way that uh, Jesus loves the church. Um, I'm going to do what I want. I, my home is my home, and I'm just not going to be a Christian down there. But I did pray the prayer, or I did get baptized, and I am saved. So am I free to ignore mm. the commands of Jesus when it comes to my wife and still be okay? And should I just go liberty? You know, you could do whatever you want because uh, it's not a essential issue. And I would say, first of all, it may not be essential for salvation, but it's essential for a godly marriage. It's essential yeah. if you want to raise your children to know the Lord. See, what we've done is we've gone, hey, um, these issues that, that people disagree on, I mean, it should be. Let's, let's for the sake of agreeing to be in unity. Let's um, let's let's have. We may disagree on women elders or women pastors, right? I mean, there's plenty of churches doing that right now. Uh, we have a woman pastor, a woman elder. Paul, you know, it's a different context. He didn't really mean that. Or they'll say, you know, Paul was actually letting some of his uh, his cultural upbringing actually taint his teaching there. Mm-hmm. And plus, Paul's writings are good, but they're not the red letters, right. so I can mm. do whatever I want, mm. uh, and they come up with ways to reject what, what God says in other places and say, since it's not essential for salvation, you're free to do what you want. To me, that seems dangerous. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I think there's a part of, and here at Real Life, we do, we, I mean, uh, to be on staff, there are topics where we see that biblical people who love God's word, because at some point, the the analogy that you're using, someone's dismissing God's word. Mm-hmm. But here at, at Real Life, we have people who both love God's word, and that, which is we wouldn't hire someone who didn't, and they're able to kind of back up with evidence an idea that maybe you and that other pastor slightly disagree on. And so there is this liberty, but we would all agree that let's just take uh, the gift of tongues. We'd all agree that wherever you f- land on that topic, inside of First Corinthians, there are some things that are clearly stated. And if you if you th- are promoting that, well, then you're not you're not in line with Scripture. It's clear there, and you'd be out of line. And so I feel like like well, there's let's, a, let's unpack that. Yeah, because that's a great example. Yeah, we have people on staff that believe that the spiritual gifts are active today in the same way they were in the first century. Right. And so speaking in tongues is a part of their 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 walk with God. Yeah. We have others that, like like myself, who don't um, see that as a normative way he functions today. It was for a time and a place to to affirm the old the, the new covenant, just as God did miraculous things for the old covenant. And they were they were miraculous signs to affirm the word according to Hebrews 2. I see it differently. But it, as I look at people on our staff who disagree on that issue, they're first of all coming at it from Scripture, right, right, and what we've agreed on is, um, it's not a salvation issue. You can speak in tongues or not speak in tongues and still be saved, yep. right. But there is a place that we have to stand together to be able to function as a team, and we follow what First Corinthians says about order in the church. Mm-hmm. You know, there's not going to be a place where where People are going to speak in tongues outside of the order that God gives. One at a time, he goes into, the, uh, you know, there, there's, Jesus makes it clear, if you're going to pray, don't do it, so everybody can see, but go into your closet. We're going we're gonna to take this non-essential issue, and we're not going to elevate it to a place of prominence so people can divide over it. Right. And we're going to go, in Scripture, it says there's order that has to be in place, and we set that up going, here's where we're going to agree together. Uh, and in 25 years, we haven't had staff issues over that because we agree. If you're going to speak in tongues, there's a place for you to do it. It's in your closet. We're not going to be divisive about it. Uh, for, if it ever were to happen, there would be an interpreter because mm-hmm. the Bible says there has to be mm-hmm. so everybody can understand. Uh, 
Uh, it'll be done in order. It's not everybody speaking in tongues at the same time. The Bible condemns that. Yeah. Uh, the Bible is clear about what happens in the corporate body. So the same God who introduces that tongues were existing in the first church yep. is the same God who puts boundaries on how it would be used right. in the first church. And so we, we, we have come to this place where we're going to be organized together, and, uh, and, and so is, that's kind of what you're talking about, right? Yeah, and I think, I think the most important part is that we're all looking at Scripture and we're elevating it above ourselves to say, this is the boundary lines, where any person who's dismissing of Scripture to say, yeah, I don't really like that part, they're out of line just to begin with, mm -hmm. because they've taken God's Word and they've devalued it. I think of and I'm going to not know the reference, it's in the Old Testament, but that God seeks those who tremble at his word. Mm -hmm. Why do they tremble? Mm -hmm. Not because God's, you know, he, obviously God's a loving father who loves me, but the fact that he can say anything he wants and he has authority over mm -hmm. my life. And it's my job before I even know what he says to be like, I'm going to be obedient, God. Yeah. You're the creator. You you own me. You made me. And so there's a there's a trembling that's like, God, you're you're fearsome, even though you're my loving father who made me. And so I come to your word really submissive before the get go. Yeah. And that's the spirit that we should come to God's word in. Um, yeah. Well, I think about, OK, so remember that statement <clears throat> in essentials, unity in non-essentials, liberty. Again, Paul made it very clear that don't use your freedom to do something to cause mm -hmm. somebody else to stumble. Right, so freedom has its limitations, and it doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. Uh, but then the last of that statement, but in all things love. So what that means is, if even if we disagree and we can't be in the same church together, because let's say you strongly believe in the charismatic gifts, they're still practicing today, and it ought to be happening in your church. Well, I can love you and call you a Christian, but that doesn't mean. First of all, that I get to treat you poorly or, or in anger or in sure. all things, whether I agree or disagree. And sometimes mm -hmm. it may mean that we don't even, we can't even actually work in the same church together, but we're still brothers in Christ and there's a place over there for that. I'm going to treat you with love, right? And, and love doesn't always mean affirming because love mm -hmm. is an act of the will right. to lay down your life for another. And if you love them, it does not rejoice with unrighteousness. So love means I'm going to care about you. I'm going to be kind as I can be. I'm going to, I'm going to give grace and mercy to you. At the same time, though, there's limits on what can, what can be done in a church because of unity. Mm -hmm. I think about this. We have churches that we planted here, that uh, mm -hmm. folks came from here. And for instance, on the role of women in the church, they came to be willing to call women pastors. Uh, they started having women being the, the main teachers in services, uh, in weekend services with the collective. The Bible is clear for 2,000 years. The, the rearranging the, uh, the information in such a way that it's possible to do today is a modern view of mm -hmm. this topic. For us as a church, we said, okay, you're not our enemies, but our level of partnership is not the same as it was. Because for us, for you to create a way around the historical meaning means that that methodology you just used can be used on other scripture. So it's not just about the women's rules issue. It's about creating a way around the clear and historic meaning of mm -hmm. a text. Just as Matthew Vines did on the gay Christian, you can do on uh, uh, the role of women. You can come up with a way to uh, look at a old scripture in a new way and change the meaning of the old scripture. Mm. And so when you start monkeying around with how to interpret scripture, you may create this way and only use it on that topic. But then, no, 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 you can't use it on that one. No, once you created a new way to read and look at scripture, you can use that on anything you choose to. And so for us, some of our churches that we planted are no longer in partnership with us. And, uh, and we're not, and again, they're not our enemies. They're out there, you know, doing what they think is right. And, uh, but they're not at this level of partnership. And for us, a partnership as members, uh, another ministry we work with, like maybe Genesis or whatever, mm -hmm. it, the closer the partnership, the tighter we have to be on being aligned around where we're going and what we believe in. Mm -hmm. So our, our 101 class, our every year 301 class is all designed to make sure that mm -hmm. we do not drift, 
We keep going down that direction so we can be aligned and organized and live out a faith. And, and again, we're not going to allow things uh, that are new ideas of something to replace old first century ideas of things. There's some things that are abiblical, mm -hmm. meaning there's nothing in it about it, fine, right? The Bible doesn't say anything about a, a guitar and a sound system. So you're free to do things. If it does say something, you're not free to dismiss what it says. Does that make, I mean, yeah. yep. would you add anything as we close this down today? Yeah, I think that, you know, it kind of goes back to some of the core values we try to implore as a church when it comes to disciple making and each person has their part, right? Every individual has their part to decide who they believe they're going to follow and entrust to lead them closer to God. Mm. Every individual has that decision. And so we want to invite people to say, we believe that we're doing our very best to seek out the faith that has been once and for all delivered. Here's how we see that. And we're inviting new people into that to go through that process, which leads me to myself. And, and I think I would end it with this is even as a child that has been parented, right? We talk about in disciple making that there's those that have greater maturity that are bringing along those that are growing in maturity. In my own walk, both in faith and just as a, an individual, a human being, there's a lot of seasons and a lot of topics in my life that I didn't necessarily like. And you mentioned this in your message that didn't necessarily feel good or that I enjoyed or was something that I aspired to participate in, I needed to learn. And I had to, I had to be grown up and to grow into maturity. And that's same in my faith as well to go, hmm, is there something that God's trying to teach me in? Is he making me and forging me into Christ likeness? And does that always feel good? It doesn't. No. And so there's challenges and I have my own issues and my own hangups and everybody does a myriad of topics we've talked about, which is just because my feelings and experience dictate something doesn't necessarily override the truth that God has laid out. Mm -hmm. And so I need people to do that. Well, I gotta, I gotta have people go, Hey man, I think you kind of have a bent this way and Hey, maybe that's hard. Tell me more about what's going on to help me learn through the process yeah. rather than just go, it's a new thing or today or our culture or even my own family of origin is, is leaning this way or this has been my experience. My experience and my feelings doesn't dictate and override the truth that has been generational since creation. And so I know that that's a process. And I just throw that out there for today mm. just to remind myself and, you know, others or small group leaders or, you know, I always want to check my heart in these conversations yeah. to go, what's motivating a person to want to change what maybe is true? What's happened? What have they been through? What has been lacking? Mm -hmm. And how do, we, how do we operate in empathy and in care and love, right? All things love, not the point, but I'll use it, right? To go, what's going on in, in, in this person to help, right? Because we can really, I can be quick to argue. And, but helping them doesn't mean we support what's going on. But we're like, hey, helping means bring them in line Correct. with God's word. And one of the things that yeah. we believe around here, guys, and for anybody who's on the podcast, we believe in the authority of God's holy word. Yep. And we believe interpreting that as best we can with a good conscience, interpreting that through what the church believed in the first century. And uh, because historically, um, who could understand best what was written? Those who were there. And so uh, we look very closely at the historicity of any doctrine, of any belief, and we're skeptical of most things that are new when it comes to theology. Uh, in fact, I can't think of one thing we're not skeptical about. If it's new, it's probably not right. And, uh, and so uh, that's where we stand as a church. I hope that this uh, podcast has helped you today. Uh, again, Overtime Podcast, every week we do it, we go a little bit deeper. And uh, if you have some questions for us, make sure you email them in. And uh, God bless you. Hopefully see you this, this next weekend.